are listening to the AOTA podcast. Here is your host, Matt Brandenburg. Today, I am joined by Mary Beth Clifton, an occupational therapist and professor at University of Nebraska Medical Center. Mary Beth, thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, thank you for having me, Matt. Our presenting sponsor for the AOTA podcast is New York University Steinhardt's Department of Occupational Therapy. And interestingly enough, Mary Beth, we actually were in the same cohort of occupational therapy school. So it's amazing to catch up and talk about some of the research you've been doing since we graduated. Uh, We connected at Inspire 2023, where you presented a short course on toxic stress in children and youth. I wanted to start by discussing some of your background, Mary Beth. What kind of motivated you to be a part of this study and to pursue this research path in your career? Likewise, Matt, it's really great to be here and catch up with you a little bit. As you said, I'm an assistant professor in the occupational therapy program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I'm a pediatric OT with a background working in community level programming and initiatives, particularly those focused around mental and behavioral health of children and youth. I just have a long standing passion and interest working in this area. I'm very excited to talk with you a little bit more about the project. And um, I actually started this as part of my OTD scholarly coursework at Washington University in St. Louis with the support of my mentor, Dr. Lauren Milton. And I'd also like to shout out another member of our research team, Dr. Laura Bowden. We couldn't do anything without these mentors that provide, you know, that guidance and kind of expertise, especially for uh, newer practitioners like, like yourself and myself. What really is the physiological stress response? What are the physical signs um, that kind of show someone's experiencing it and, and what impact do those have? The stress response is a normal and healthy part of our development, and it's activated by exposure to some type of stressful events. This could range from a physical injury to a major life change or transition, relationship difficulty, specific to this study, a trauma or adverse childhood experience. So when a child or really anyone experiences a traumatic event, the sympathetic nervous system signals the adrenal glands to release stress hormones. Um, That includes adrenaline, cortisol, and what happens is it causes our hearts to beat faster, our respiration rates to increase, blood vessels in our arms and legs to dilate, our digestive processes change, our blood sugar levels increase. And this is all in order to deal with a perceived threat. And you mentioned how it's a typical part of development. What would you say is really the difference between a positive stress response, a tolerable stress response, and then a toxic stress response to an adverse event or something else going on in someone's life. As you're suggesting, there are these varying types of stress response, which again, have that potential to become maladaptive or harmful. So a positive stress response would be something that is moderate, short-lived. You may have a physiological response, such as a brief increase in your heart rate, a mild elevation of your stress hormones, whereas a tolerable stress response is more serious, though it is temporary. And this type of stress response can be buffered by environmental resources that a child had access to. This could include having a supportive or safe relationship with an adult to help bring you back down to baseline. And then lastly, there's a toxic stress response, which is the prolonged or excessive activation of one's stress response. And this is due to environmental stressors in the absence of that protection. Um, So maybe no protective or safe relationships with an adult, no coping strategies or other supports that are needed to recover. So when we have this chronic stress, experiencing stressors over a prolonged and persistent period of time, it can ultimately result in a long-term drain on our body. Um, So as our autonomic nervous system continues to trigger these physical reactions, it causes a wear and tear on the body. What are some specifics of that wear and tear? How does this prolonged stress response really impact development um, physiologically, especially among children? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, traumatic experiences don't just happen to children. They happen inside their brains and bodies. And um, this can have a huge impact on skill development, overall well-being and occupation. Because the brain's plasticity, particularly during early life development, um, it's very susceptible and open to modification by early life experiences. Um, what this might look like is impacting the architecture of areas of the brain that are critical to learning, memory, executive functioning, such as the amygdala, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. When it's activating that release of those stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, that can ultimately have an impact on a child's immune system, cardiovascular system, and metabolic systems. And when we have these overall impacts on these systems that are critical to our health and development, then we see an outcome of impairment in physical, mental health, and that can last into adulthood. That's such an interesting point. I work in pediatrics as well, and so much we view plasticity as working to a child's advantage uh, because there's so much opportunity to make functional gains um, and and to cope for certain you know deficits or disorders or diagnoses that may be impacting the brain in a child. But at the same time, it sounds like this prolonged stress response due to children having so much plasticity can lead to children you know, coping in in a, a way that's negative or impacts their occupational performance in the negative. What effect does this have socially? And, and does that example really make sense? Or am I way out in left field on that? <laughs> no, no, you're right. Um, toxic stress, that prolonged exposure to trauma can impact occupational performance. So you're asking about how it can impact a child socially. So when those executive function skills or social emotional skills are impaired, um, perhaps you would have a child where you see poor boundaries or difficulty or even lack of interest interacting with others. Other childhood occupations it could impact is school performance. So with impairment to cognitive skills, you might see some difficulty with school occupations. Um, again, difficulty regulating emotions, which could result in difficulty with behaviors at school. Maybe a child's having difficulty cognitively attending while in class, or maybe they're having trouble even making it to school due to their overall health or not having basic needs met at home. Outside of school performance, social performance, these children might just have a decreased interest and in motivation to participate in their daily routines, basic ADLs, their sleep might be impacted. Of course, these are just a list of examples, and it can look so different for each child and really just depends on their specific situation and the supports that they have. Uh, so the stress response really impacts everyone individually, uh, but there are large impacts on occupational performance and mental health and overall well-being. How, how can this prolonged stress response lead to what is known as occupational deprivation? Yeah, so trauma can and it certainly does impact occupations and opportunities to engage in meaningful activity, which can lead to occupational deprivation. I'd like to highlight again that there are these community level adversities, such as living in poverty, experiencing racism and discrimination, community level violence, or living in unsafe neighborhoods that can be traumatic experiences too. So maybe children who are from resource constrained situations or children of various marginalized identity groups who have limited access or opportunities opportunity because of systemic injustice and inequities in this country are in fact experiencing adverse childhood events or childhood trauma. And so in this case, you have decreased access due to systems beyond the individual, and this can lead to occupational deprivation. Ultimately, I would say occupational deprivation and occupational injustices that are really systemic and pervasive throughout this country and experienced by many can cause 
be the cause of trauma and can result in situations where a child simply hasn't had the opportunity to explore or participate in an occupation when compared to their peers. Maybe some examples of this could be, again, that limited opportunity to interact or socialize with others. Perhaps a child or family limits the places they go or the activities they participate in due to fear for safety, due to racism or discrimination. That limited exposure or knowledge of how to carry out a self-care task um, because they're not taught or didn't have the opportunity for consistent exposure, lack of resources to facilitate play um, or be involved in the community. You're so right that how there are so many systems where this unfortunately is occurring um, among children and and it's tough to leave those systems and and locations because they are all over what what about adults who have really been impacted by this stress response their whole life um, but never had it addressed never had that opportunity um, that w- what can be done into adulthood um, after experiencing these prolonged toxic stress responses? Mm -hmm. Well, developmental research tells us that this persistent and chronic exposure to trauma and toxic stress does have those long-term impacts and ultimately changes one's biobehavioral systems into adulthood. Um, Though we as humans are resilient beings and our brains and bodies do the best that they can to adjust to environmental experiences to protect ourselves through adapting coping strategies, um, perhaps even if there weren't intervention. I would say, firstly, we each have a differing level of susceptibility to environmental influences like trauma or toxic stress due to our varying genetic, physiological, and behavioral traits or markers. Um, So that could change the impact or the outcome. Um, But no matter what the journey or impact, there are therapies that focus on behavioral and cognitive coping strategies um, that can be effective for treatment in adults, as well as just generally ensuring that an individual has access to support and resources. That's encouraging and wonderful to hear. I I wanted to point out in your short course, you shared some information that really stuck out to me. Um, you talked about how the brain is just as vulnerable to positive experiences as it is to negative experiences. And we've discussed how these traumatic experiences and, and the prolonged stress response can lead to decreased occupational performance. But can you can you talk about how that point really applies. Talk about the positive plasticity that the brain can experience as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Our brain is just as susceptible to positive life experiences as negative. And something that the research around trauma really highlights is that perhaps one of the most critical factors in modifying the impact for children exposed to toxic stress is having stable and responsive relationships that foster resilience, reinforce those happy healthy adaptations for coping with stress. Um, So that's an example of a positive experience that really could change or alter the impact of toxic stress or trauma on the brain and development. Thank you, Mary Beth. That's a, a wonderful example. Our presenting sponsor is New York University Steinhardt's top ranked Department of Occupational Therapy, which now offers an entry level OTD for aspiring occupational therapists. NYU additionally offers advanced degrees for practicing therapists that can be completed in person or online. Study and work with leading educators, researchers, and master clinicians in the vibrant setting of New York City and have access to a diverse patient population and extensive healthcare system. Learn to deliver exceptional patient care or deepen your knowledge and practice as you focus on applied scientific inquiry and clinical areas such as pediatrics, developmental disabilities, mental health, and assistive rehabilitation technologies. Take the next step by visiting steinhardt.nyu.edu slash OT to learn more. I, I want to talk about your community level study um, that you discussed in this short course. Um, before we dive into that, what is a trauma-centered approach to therapy? 
on an individual level, we as occupational therapy practitioners, as well as involving other care team members, care partners, we are using a trauma-informed approach when we're making an environment safe, we're allowing a child choice and autonomy, um, we're really working in partnership with a child and working to build trust and empowering the child. Um, if we're using a trauma-informed approach, we as practitioners need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma and actively work to ensure that we're not re-traumatizing. We're remaining calm, understanding, and really helping a child to regulate. And then again, empowering them through the development of coping strategies and allowing that autonomy and choice. Um, so at an individual level, maybe we're helping them to regulate their basic physiological processes. We are remaining predictable in our approach and helping to establish routines. We're empowering them through positive reinforcements. But we can also have a trauma-informed approach, even taking a step back at more of a systems level. So collaborating with schools and other community organizations and just working to build that community awareness and understanding of trauma and how occupation-based activities can promote positive mental health and social emotional skills. There really are so many principles to glean from a trauma-centered approach that can apply across settings and across populations um, that occupational therapy practitioners work with. Really that emphasis on creating a safe space and designing the environment to to build trust and to facilitate the people we work with feeling comfortable. Those are just such important principles, I think, to apply no matter where you are or what you're doing as, as a practitioner. Yes, absolutely. Let's, let's talk now about your community level study. Um, I want to ask what made a community level intervention the best design for addressing toxic stress issues? We weren't providing a specific intervention, but rather this was a qualitative research study where we really explored the experiences and perspectives of children and youth who were exposed to toxic stress on the community level services that they were currently receiving from a community-based agency. So we, as of the research team, didn't go in to intervene or implement any services, but we really just wanted to understand the lived experiences of these children and youth. And we did this through a series of focus groups with the children and youth at the agency. You asked why was this the best design and kind of going into the community. I believe that there's really no better way to understand how something is impacting a community than being involved with community members, the people that are actually experiencing a given phenomenon, in this case, chronic exposure to trauma, than them themselves and talking to and asking questions of those, again, that are experiencing it. That's such a great point. I think occupational therapy practitioners have the opportunity to contribute to overall community health. And that's such a great example of how occupational therapy can do that and use kind of this unique OT lens to community issues that can truly make an impact and improve the lives, not just of people practitioners work with on an individual basis, but entire communities. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's it's easy for practitioners to kind of jump right into community level interventions? Uh, would you recommend they start with an individual approach? How does a practitioner or a researcher kind of make that jump to, to widen their scope to think more and do more within their community? Well, I think there's really no saying that one approach is better than another. As occupational therapy practitioners, we do have a lot of training on how to provide assessment and intervention at an individual level. Um, but to provide a holistic approach to therapy, I think we should always be taking a step back when we're working with individuals to understand their story, their community, and the systems that have an influence on their life. So we should remember as occupational therapy practitioners, just as you said, it's certainly within our scope to provide assessment and intervention, not just for individuals, but groups and populations at a community level. We can take a step back, you know, consider how we can provide intervention either directly through integrating services at a community level or indirectly through 
education or training or advocacy, really taking on that public health perspective to promote health and well-being at that population level. I love it. I love that so much. Tell, tell us about your partnership agency. How did you approach them and, and present this collaboration? The partnership agency um, was a community-based agency that serves youth and children who are at risk due to their exposure to toxic stress. Um, that organization was located in a city in the Western United States. Um, we chose that agency just from observation. There was no current occupational therapy services there, um, though we as the research team would describe the services provided by the agency to be very occupation based. Um, they provided a range of therapeutic services to support mental and behavioral health, focusing on life skill development, social emotional learning, healthy involvement in the community. And so they provide both clinical group type services during after school time and summertime for the children and youth, as well as educational services where children can attend the agency kind of as an alternative setting to complete their academic work while issues such as behavioral health challenges can be addressed. How did we approach them in our collaboration? Really, in my experience, both with this partnership agency and other community level work that I've done, it really just takes time to develop relationships with partnership agencies. Um, it takes that time building trust and transparency. And we didn't want this project to be something that we could just benefit from to add to our understanding of the services and their population served. But how could we help build their capacity within their own organization? So not only were we able to glean valuable information from the focus groups that we held with the youth at the agency, but through additional anecdotal interactions with the agency leadership and community members, we were able to provide them back an executive summary um, as a means to support the community partner in their own quality improvement related to their services, their employee dynamics, and their relationships with community partners. That's such a wonderful example of community partnership and how it can really benefit so many people involved. What were some of the specific adverse experiences that the children involved with this um, agency and, and within your study uh, were experiencing and, and going through? Yeah, so the population served by the agency, and this was described by the agency leadership as well as community members, includes predominantly low income, living in diverse or challenging home situations, such as um, being in foster care, single parent homes, unstable or unstructured home life. The children attending the agency had a variety of mental health diagnoses from post-traumatic stress disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and really were having some of those behavioral or emotional regulation difficulties impacting their academic performance, their socialization skills. Um, some of the specific ways or phrases that agency leadership talked about the children and youth at the agency experiencing was not hearing I love you at home, drug or alcohol issues, um, abuse in the home, food insecurity, parents with lack of effective parenting skills. And that's just to kind of name a few of the the experiences that these children and youth had. What did you really learn or what were some of the findings from your study, from these breakout focus groups and, and what you were um, seeing and hearing there? Yeah. So what we learned from the the focus groups with these children and youth is that the community-based agency provided them really that opportunity to acquire critical life skills. And so these are life skills needed to interact with each other or others in their environment in a pro-social way. They also discussed the importance of the therapy or counseling services that they were receiving, um, having supportive adults when they were sad, when they were angry, when they were frustrated. They talked about developing social skills for productive living. So those social skills to engage with others as well as emotional coping and self-regulation skills. The participants also talked with us a lot about a positive culture at the agency. Um, they talked about just feeling a general sense of caring, shared community, 
They felt like they could trust the agency. They had privacy to discuss sensitive matters. They felt comfortable and safe. And then lastly, which I think is a pretty powerful and potentially informative finding, is that a few participants discussed that the agency programming provided them with an opportunity to do. So this is kind of speaking to that idea of occupational deprivation. They felt like coming here provided them a meaningful activity. Um, And so I think that just speaks to the need for more research to look at the importance of structured, meaningful activity for children who do experience occupational deprivation as either the means or outcome of experiencing trauma. Those are such powerful outcomes that um, that power you mentioned of just the ability to do and the feeling that you're safe to to do something and to participate and to gain those life skills um, and feel supported while doing so. Um, I remember in your short course, you shared some quotes uh, from some of the participants in your study, um, and it sounded like one of the kind of emerging themes some of the participants discussed were not feeling alone. Can you talk to us about kind of that sentiment and and power of children not feeling alone? The adverse effects of toxic stress alone do not predict poor outcomes for this population. It's the experience of toxic stress in the absence of or insufficiency of having those protective factors in their social and physical environment. So just like we talked about earlier, positive experiences are just as impactful as those negative experiences. And I think that sentiment of not feeling alone is speaking to what the research tells us again about having that supportive and responsive relationship with at least one adult in your life can have such an impact for these children to have that sense of safety to help restore their maladaptive stress response. That truly is amazing. Sometimes all it takes is is one positive, supportive and, and safe relationship um, with an adult to, to help a child in that way. Can you define kind of what a buffer is and explain how community level programming can act as a buffer for children who who are experiencing stress and, and may need one? A buffer is something that can modify or perhaps dampen the effects of something. So in this case, a community level program has demonstrated based on the qualitative feedback that we receive from the participants that it may be serving as a social or environmental buffer, perhaps dampening the physiological stress response by fostering skill development, those critical skills, again, in an environment that is positive, safe, and supportive among their peers and trusted adults. We really need more research with this population, though, specifically to demonstrate occupational therapies continued benefit in these community settings and providing occupation-based intervention. I love that. And Mary Beth, you in this study are such a great example of, of the research that um, needs to be ongoing. Um, and, and we need to, to keep encouraging uh, within this profession and um, to, to partner with, with other professions and agencies and services to do so. Um, what recommendations would you give to practitioners and our listeners who maybe want to begin to address stress among their client population? Where's a good starting point or or what's an action um, plan that you'd recommend to them? Everyone experiences stressful events in their lives and the likelihood that we as occupational therapy practitioners will work with clients who have or are experiencing stress or a trauma is relatively significant. So with that being said, it's my belief that all practitioners should be mindful of this and be addressing these factors in their practice. Um, So my recommendations would be to, again, take kind of that systems level justice oriented lens to consider even wider, more holistic array of factors that could be influencing an individual. Um, Specifically, really take some time for critical reflexivity to understand, you know, any bias, judgment or experiences that you bring to the table that could possibly impact client interactions, therapeutic outcomes. 
ensure that you really feel comfortable to adequately address stress or trauma by taking training or continuing education and really having difficult conversations that push you a little bit outside of your level of comfort. And then again, ensuring that you are really ready to practice with cultural humility and using that trauma-informed approach to make sure that you are creating a safe, secure, and comfortable space for the individuals that you work with. I love that. What resources would you recommend to practitioners who want to learn more about this topic, who maybe want to learn more about critical reflexivity um, and uh, those those principles or recommendations you you gave? Resources that I would recommend specific to trauma or toxic stress and kind of starting to add to your level of comfort would be the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. They have some wonderful resources that might be a good starting point for you and just kind of understanding maybe where your strengths or areas to continue to develop, um, as does the National Child Stress Network. Thank you for those recommendations. Mary Beth, what can practitioners do to begin to expand their scope and become more involved in community level interventions? Well, first and foremost, I would say that you need to understand the community well and the needs of the community that you're working with. So I would recommend starting by just being an active listener and asking questions to better understand what the community needs and wants versus imposing what we think is needed or wanting up, wanted upon a community. Um, so I'd start there, determine what the need is and then how that aligns with your interests, your expertise and what you can bring to the table. Um, and then start to get to know what programs or initiatives are currently in the community. There's this idea of collective impact, which highlights the fact that we don't make large scale social change in silos with isolated intervention, but rather by cross sector coordination, group collaboration, you know, we can really work with each other. Um, So I would figure out where else needs are being addressed, who else is interested in addressing it, and then perhaps considering how you can build capacity within existing systems. I love that. That's such a, a wonderful perspective. And it's really, you know, an application of the OT process um, of being, you know, person centered, but kind of evolving that to be community centered um, and look at the community with that, that same frame. Um, so I, I love that recommendation, Mary Beth. We are now to the golden nugget segment. Uh, this is our concluding segment of the show. Mary Beth, if you could tell practitioners one thing, what would it be? I might have to end with a couple golden nuggets. Um, I would say first and foremost, practice self-care and model it for your clients. This can be hard and heavy work and there's no shame in prioritizing yourself, keeping your cup full so that you can pour into others. Advocate for the expansion of the role of OT and mental health services. We have a place and a role and we should advocate for the formal recognition of occupational therapy practitioners as qualified mental health providers. And then finally, um, what we talked a lot about the negative impact of toxic stress on trauma on the brain and development. But um, again, as Matt and I, you know, talked about throughout this episode is that the brain is just as vulnerable to positive experiences as it is to negative. I love that, Mary Beth. Thank you for leaving us with multiple golden nuggets. Um, They've been evident throughout this whole entire interview. Um, I just want to thank you again. This has been informative. It's been inspirational um, and really emphasized the the fit and the need for community level interventions um, in this area. So I just want to thank you again so much for your time. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mary Beth, for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you, listener, for tuning in. And thank you to NYU Steinhardt Program in Occupational Therapy for sponsoring this episode. Thanks for listening to the AOTA podcast. Tune in again next time.